Good evening, everybody. My name is Michael Rooks, Wheeland Family Curator of Contemporary and Modern Art at the High Museum. I was just looking at my first acquisition here at the High Museum, a painting by Kehinde Wiley from his World Stage Brazil series, painted in 2009. Um, obviously, I'm here in the galleries um, where uh, we're hosting the Obama Portraits Tour. In fact, it's open still. Uh, we are keeping our galleries open until 7 p.m every evening so that people have extra time to see the exhibition after work. So uh, I just uh, passed through a line of people uh, happily going into the exhibition just a moment ago. So thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, the exhibition that we're talking about this evening is the Obama Portraits Tour, uh, which was organized by the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery in Washington, DC. The, the national tour uh, brings these paintings to five cities across the country from coast to coast. And potentially it's providing an opportunity for millions of people to see these paintings who may not otherwise have the opportunity to travel to Washington to see them after the tour has been completed. Support for this national tour has been generously provided by Bank of America and leading supporters for the exhibition at the High Museum are BlackRock, Graphic Packaging International, Mac Wilburn, and funders Kent and Tamara Kelly and Sally and Alan McDaniel. Le uh, the exhibition, we have lots of sponsors, so I've got a long uh, list here. We're grateful for all of them. Uh, the exhibition here in Atlanta is also made possible by the High's premier sponsor, Delta Airlines. Our premier sponsors, ACT Foundation, Sarah and Jim Kennedy, Louise Sams and Jerome Griot, the estate of Dr. Joan H. Weens, Wish Foundation, and Harry Norman Realtors, and our benefactors, supporters, Robin and Hilton Howell. Thank you all. Of course, a big thanks to our ambassador and contributing supporters. And finally, a heartfelt thanks to you. That is, uh, you, our viewer, viewers at home who are members of the High Museum. We can't do what we do without you. We do what we do for you, in fact. So if you're not a member of the museum, um, please go to high.org at the end of the program and join uh, or renew if you need to renew your membership. We, we uh, want you to be part of our family here. So we're pr privileged this evening to be joined by guests from the National Portrait Gallery, Gallery, the curators of the Obama Portraits Tour, Drs. Dorothy Moss and Taina Caragol. I'll begin with Dorothy. Dorothy Moss is curator of painting and sculpture at the National Portrait Gallery. She directed the last three iterations of the Outwin Bookkeeper Portrait Competition, most notably perhaps the 2016 edition, uh, which was won by Amy Sherald. Her current exhibition, Hung Lu, Portraits of a Promised Land, is on view at the National Portrait Gallery through May 30th. And Moss's forthcoming exhibitions this year include One Life, Maya Lin, and Kinship, I believe there's a subtitle to Kinship, but Dorothy, you can help me with that later. But uh, you're curating both of those exhibitions this year with Leslie Ureña, Taina Caragol, and Robin Ais Aiselson. Um, and now, uh, well, rather, let me continue. Uh, in 2015, um, Dorothy Moss initiated the Portrait Gallery's first performance series, which is called Identify. Um, it's an ongoing series, which is already commissioned 10 performances by globally recognized artists. And she's also the co-author, of course, of the exhibition catalog for the exhibition, The Obama Portraits Tour, published by Princeton University Press. Of course, the other co-author of that publication is our other guest, Taina Caragol. Taina Caragol is curator of painting and sculpture, as well as Latinx art and history at the National Portrait Gallery. Her scholarship focuses on Latin American, Latinx, art and the recovery of suppressed and perhaps erased histories in our nation's history. Since joining the National Portrait Gallery in 2013, Caragol has significantly increased the representation of Latin American historical figures as well as Latin ex artists and others through acquisitions and exhibitions at the museum, such as One Life, Dolores Huerta and Unseen, Our Past in a New Light. Ken Gonzalez Day and Titus Kafar. She's the director of the next Outwin Bookkeeper competition in 22, and will be co curating the Outwin 22 American Portraiture today, 
with Leslie Ureña this April. So before we begin our conversation, I'll begin with a brief overview of our exhibition at the High Museum, which I hope everyone watching has uh, been to see already, and if not, uh, something to look forward to. And if we go to the next slide, our first slide, in fact, you'll see the title wall for the exhibition at the High Museum. So the exhibition was designed, was curated by our guests, um, weaving together multiple stories. And we wanted to tell those stories in the exhibition, uh, borrowing heavily, of course, from their wonderful catalog for the exhibition. And those stories tell the process of commissioning a presidential portrait, um, the personal journeys of the artists, and the making of the paintings. Um, so we begin there. We begin with, um, as you see, how do we, how do we envision the, the process of commissioning a portrait? And then one of the unique things we've done so thus far on the tour is to separate the paintings so that our visitors have their own intimate personal moments with each painting. So beginning with the portrait of Michelle Obama in the first gallery with a long sort of sightline as you come to approach this uh, amazing portrait by Amy Sherald. And then uh, rounding the corner after you've had a moment to spend time with this painting, you made President Obama, uh, the portrait by Gehinde Wiley. We, uh, after, after you've had a chance to spend time with the paintings, get a good look at them up close. Uh, we uh, have a, a section in the gallery where we're breaking down the iconog iconographic program of each painting, both the Amy Sherald painting here, you can see how we are pointing out uh, the uh, dress that she is pictured wearing, which becomes a scaffold for the iconographic program of the painting, including uh, details that refer to the G's Bend uh, quilting practices that include a, a, um, this design, this pattern called birds in the air, we called it out here in our wall graphic, as well as President Obama's iconographic program, which is really uh, told in the language of flowers, really wonderful uh, conceit by the artist Kehinde Wiley. And then there is a film that uh, we have in the exhibition that was produced by the National Portrait Gallery, which tells really the whole story of, of the making of the paintings and what it means uh, today uh, to, um, to have these paintings enter uh, such a, a revered collection. Uh, in addition to all of that, we of course invite our audience to come to the gallery to meet um, our painting by Kennedy Wiley and to find other connections between the exhibition and our collection here, including the quilt by Lucy Petway, which I mentioned earlier, Birds in the Air. And then if you uh, come to see this painting behind me, you'll also become introduced to young artists, new artists who are exploring aspects of black portraiture today, including this wonderful painting by Amako Boafo, a Ghanaian artist, a new acquisition uh, by the museum, it's on view. Painting on the left by Gerald Lavelle, who's an Atlanta artist, will be, uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, will be entering the collection. It's a pro proposed acquisition. It will be in my forthcoming exhibition in March. Um, there's another painting, I believe, in the screen. It's a painting by Pepe Sol Solomon, who was a Liberian Civil War refugee, now based in Arizona, a uh, painting of a fellow uh, refugee, um, uh, Benjamin uh, Gasinga Gaspard. So that's what you'll experience here at the museum. And we're hoping that the exhibition will invite you to, to explore the collections and to see connections, not only with the exhibition and the portraits of the Obamas, but also to think about how portraiture looks and today and what it means today. So with that, welcome again, Dorothy and Taina. Uh, it's such a pleasure to have you here tonight and uh, we're, we're grateful for your time uh, with us this evening. Uh, perhaps I'll begin first with a question for Taina and that is um, about the process. Uh, you were intimately directly involved with the, the commissioning of the portrait of President Obama. Could you walk us through that process? How does it happen and uh, um, Maybe also what I find interesting about the process in terms of at least the portrait uh, by Kehinde Wiley is that the president was intimately involved in the process. Correct. Um, it's first of all, wonderful to be here with you, Michael, and uh, with the wonderful audience of the High Museum. Um, 
And, and yes, it was my great privilege uh, together with Dorothy Moss to uh, be the curators who shepherded these two commissions um, along with Brandon Brain Fortune, our Emerita curator. Um, this is a process that is really a collaboration between the National Portrait Gallery and the White House. It, uh, the, 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 the portrait of, the commissioned portrait of a president comes um, at the end of their term. And so um, the whole process for these particular two portraits uh, happened um, towards the end of President Obama's term. Um, it took approximately two years. Uh, it started with a serious um, session of thinking about some ideal candidates for these portraits. And uh, we put together portfolios of possible candidates and they were artists of different generations, artists who painted in different styles, um, artists who approached portraiture in different ways, um, quite a variety of them, uh, but who artists who we thought would um, undertake this task with um, appreciation, you know, would be would be honored by it, and would um, would create wonderful artworks, right? And so, once we compiled these. Um, portfolios, we send them to the White House curator who discussed them with the Obamas. And um, they studied them very carefully. They eventually chose several artists to interview. I hear those interviews were quite um, thrilling, as you can imagine, if you can put yourself in the shoes of the artists. Uh, just the, the, the opportunity of being in the Oval Office, having that conversation uh, with uh, President, pr former President Barack Obama or former First Lady Michelle Obama must have been quite amazing. Amazing. And uh, eventually they came to uh, choose these artists. Um, and so that's really when the curator enters uh, the picture in a different capacity, which is more um, serving as an institutional link between the, the artist and the sitter and um, making sure that the artist is at ease and also the sitter, that they're having a good conversation, that they are, um, that they are understanding each other and um, in order to create this upcoming image. And it was a radical break, the decision to commission these two artists, a radical break with tradition, uh, not only tradition, but also just aesthetics. Did you anticipate, was it, was it surprising to you both or did you anticipate something exciting given the, the Obama's interest and involvement with contemporary art during the, the terms in the White House? We, um, I think we expected something um, daring and bold. Um, the Obamas were a couple who supported contemporary art, who surrounded themselves by, by modern and contemporary art, who uh, had a very clear notion of what art can say beyond the illustrative. You know, that art can bear many, can convey many different messages. And so uh, we had quite a range of artists for the, to, to choose. And um, they chose some fantastic ones, really. Um, it is, it, it's surprising because it goes against the grain of traditional state portraiture, but at the same time, it's not that surprising for a couple who was uh, so forward thinking in, uh, in, their, in their taste and love of art. Absolutely. Dorothy, did you have a, something to add to that? Well, I think um, given that the Obamas are art collectors and that in their during their time in Washington, they spent time walking through the museums in the evenings when the museums were closed with their daughters. And they made many visits to the National Portrait Gallery and thought about how their portraits could make a statement. Um, 
in the context of the entire museum, not just the, um, the America's president's installation, but the entire history of portraiture. They were so deliberate about their choices and, and, and their conversations with the potential artists. They wanted to know what kind of messages their artwork would carry forward. Um, so it was a real pleasure to watch. We felt as if they were co-curators in this, in some respects, which was really exciting. I think that's so interesting. And you both make a brilliant point in the exhibition text and the catalog that the, the Obama presidency was the first presidency during the so, social media age where they really understood intuitively the value of an image today and, and how it works. Um, and we see that in the exhibition where people are taking selfies. It's something that people do all the time. But uh, in the, also I'm thinking about an image we'll see a little bit later. I, I pulled an image of your portrait of President Lincoln, another former Senator from Illinois, uh, who also wa was an interesting historical figure in that his presidency occurred during the rise of photography as an influential sort of messaging uh, or a medium rather. So maybe- Exactly, I, and I, well, I was just going to say, I think the Obama's interest in young people and their understanding of the influence of social media and um, the internet and the way images travel and influence thinking um, played into their choices of these artists as well. So Dorothy, maybe may I ask you, uh, can you describe the, that impact uh, upon the unveiling of the paintings? There was the initial leak, which generated all this excitement, of course, but then upon the unveiling of the paintings, there was this uh, tremendous uh, impact uh, through social media, but also through uh, many other channels. Um, and it's unique. Uh, it's something I think none of us have ever seen. We had never seen anything like this um, at the National Portrait Gallery with the unveiling of a president and first lady's portraits. There were lines out the door around the building. Um, we had initially installed Michelle Obama's portrait on the first floor off our lobby. And the crowds were so dense that we actually had to move her painting up to the third floor to make room for the lines. Um, and so, you know, this was spectacular and transformative. Um, the year after we unveiled these portraits, our attendance doubled. So that, that says a lot. Um, and, and, it's, and people wanted to wait in line for long periods of time and talk with each other. And it became kind of a communal experience where people and I'm sure you're seeing this at the high, take turns posing with their family members, other visitors take their pictures, conversations unfold. Um, and so it's really more than just, it's more than the portraits. It's, it's about community and dialogue and coming together. And Taina, what does that say about the nature of portraiture today, especially in the power of seeing oneself reflected in images on the walls of a museum? But I think that's precisely the power of these of these two portraits that um, Kehinde Wiley and Amy Sherald really, um, through their own conceptual approaches to portraiture, they reinvented state portraiture. They made room for the first uh, African American president and first lady to be represented uh, in the. In, in the space of the National Portrait Gallery, in the historiography of American art and, and of global art, really. And so um, something changed with those, with those paintings. Something changed in our visual culture. And um, I think the lines that, that, that Dorothy was just mentioning really speak to that, to the fact that um, people want to see the portraits, but they want to see the portraits because in that reimagining of what a portrait can be, of what a state portrait can be, right? With the beautiful flora in the background, for example, for the president, with that pose of openness and um, engagement with the viewer, in the, uh, with uh, the portrait of Michelle Obama 
with her beautiful, uh, very approach approachable, but also statuesque presence. I think people see themselves. They they just identify with the artworks. And so um, I really had a wonderful experience um, that I remember, uh, I think, before the pandemic at our last gala. Gail King was our MC. And so she arrived on the day of the gala and it was um, and it was, uh, I have to give her a tour of the museum. We walked through the galleries and just doing her journalist work, she took out a notebook and asked everyone. She started interviewing uh, passersby, she, museum visitors and asking them what they were, what they had come to see at the National Portrait Gallery and asking them where they were coming from. And they were coming from Brazil and from Chicago and from Texas and from France and from and all of them were there to see the Obama portraits. And I thought, wow, this is really amazing. I mean, I knew people were coming to the museum to see them, but <laughs> they are really confirming that as they speak to her. And I, I just, you know, I just saw how absolutely powerful these artworks are and how much they mean to the public. And I think that also speaks to your work. I mean, in that you focused uh, your work in some ways on making visible the invisible, uh, addressing those who've been erased from our visual history, but also our written history. And to, to see those uh, erasures um, unerased is really powerful. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, the next slide, uh, if we can move to the next slide. So uh, maybe this is a good segue because when we're thinking about well, the tremendous impact that these portraits have had in terms of your attendance and just the popularity of, of uh, and, uh, the idea of portraiture, something that wasn't so popular, I imagine, that long ago, it's really popular today. This is an image from the National Portrait Gallery of your uh, Lansdowne portrait of uh, President Washington. So you can see the very traditional installation of this famous painting. And then of course, the next slide is the painting of President Obama in your galleries. Um, so uh, these are paintings that, uh, that kind of speak to that change, this uh, incredible change that you both experienced and witnessed over the course of a decade really at the museum through your work, which we'll talk about a little bit uh, later. One of the things that I think is interesting to, to our audience is the fact that there are two collections of presidential portraits. One is at the White House and it's private and the other is at your museum and is public. So can you tell us uh, uh, this direct uh, question for both of you, uh, what the difference is between the two collections and maybe a little bit of the, the history of those collections? You know, I, one, one thing that I think people are surprised to learn often is that the National Portrait Gallery has only been commissioning portraits of the presidents um, very, since very recently with President George H.W. Bush's portrait. So what you're seeing prior to that portrait, and you do see that portrait just slightly behind President Obama's portrait to the left, um, and that's by Ronald Scher, um, what you see before that are portraits that we have acquired over time from, from a variety of sources. And, um, and really the real break and the traditional portraits um, is Elaine de Kooning's portrait of John F. Kennedy, which is absolutely vibrant. It's uh, uh, verges on abstraction. Um, and Ke both Kehinde Wiley and Amy Sherald were very drawn to that portrait when they were thinking about what they would do for us. But this tradition at the National Portrait Gallery is a fairly new one. And that portrait of, of President Kennedy in your collection is vastly different from the portrait of President Kennedy in the White House collection, right? Yes. Correct. So yes. you have a, you have, I'm sorry. No, I, I was just saying the portrait uh, by Elaine de Kooning in our collection uh, was painted for the Truman Library. And um, it became part of our collection, I think, in the 1990s. And yes, as, um, as Dorothy was saying, it's really a wonderful precedent for the portrait 
uh, of President Obama. And so the portraits in the White House are by different artists than the portraits in the National Portrait Gallery's collection. And the National Portrait Gallery has only even more recently started commissioning First Lady's portraits with uh, Hillary Clinton's portrait. Um, the national, the White House collection has a much more extensive collection of First Lady's portraits, which we actually showed um, in an installation of First Lady's portraits uh, just before the pandemic shut us down. Um, so we did have an exhibition that has a wonderful catalog of the First Lady's portraits, uh, but the National Portrait Gallery does not have a full set of First Lady's portraits. Interesting. And so is that something that uh, as curators of collection, you're, you're looking to uh, kind of fill those holes, fill those gaps somehow, or is that not possible? I think I would, we're needed. Yeah, we, we are always looking to fill gaps. Um, and it's, it's something that, you know, takes a lot of time, especially with this kind of uh, historic portraiture. But yes, right. if you have a portrait of a first lady in your collection at home, <laughs> let us know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll scour our collection here. Um, you mentioned historical uh, modes of portraiture, which is the majority of your collection. And yeah, if we can go back to the other slide of, of President Lincoln, the image on the left is the portrait in your collection, which was, I presume, made after the painting on the right, which is in the White House collection. Um, but in terms of, of typologies, uh, both Kehinde Wiley and Amy Sherald are drawing from different typologies in art history, uh, inspired by your collection, but also in other images throughout art history. It's from, in this case, uh, the image of contemplation or philosophical reflection in the image of a seated thinker. I think of Rodin's thinker, for example, or in the next slide, um, the image of, of the maternal figure of the Madonna become society portrait um, on the other hand. So um, I'm, I was thinking about these kinds of typologies that the two artists uh, are drawing from in, for their portraits of the Obamas. And it seemed to me that um, they've kind of switched roles. They've borrowed from each other's playbooks in a way because Kehinde Wiley typically paints uh, paintings that represent uh, 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 power or uh, idea, ideas about power, subverting traditional ideas about power. Whereas uh, Amy Sherald has described her work in terms of uh, the symbolic, rather than portraits, they're symbolic images. In this case, um, Amy Sherald has painted an image uh, uh, of a different kind of power, this powerful figure that I associate with images of the Renaissance Madonnas with this triangular, uh, composition. Um, and Kehinde Wiley has painted a, a symbol, something that's more symbolic in a way. Do, do, would you agree or do you think I'm talking out of my uh, ears? Let's move to the next slide. No, I, I, I definitely agree. I think there is, um, I hadn't thought about the artists borrowing from each other, but um, there's a very interesting um, sort of counterbalance in these images. And for sure, in the sense of Kahinda Wiley, it is a picture, it, it, this is a painting that breaks with uh, his um, normal modus operandi, if you will. Um, and that was something that was very interesting in the sittings um, that the president had with him. Uh, I observed how uh, they had a conversation about what kind of painting this would be. And they were both in sync in that this had to be a painting different from what we usually associate with the work of Kehinde Wiley, which as you just said, um, very often um, borrows from portraiture of aristocrats and bestows the symbols of power onto everyday uh, people of color that he casts his street casts, right? He finds on the street and, and, and invites to participate in the act of creating that portrait. In the sense, in the case of this portrait, um, President Obama said, well, I already have, have the power that the presidency um, has given me. The symbolic, that kind of symbolic power is already 
associated with me. So this needs to be a different kind of, of image. And it was very funny that, you know, at the unveiling, he said, well, you know, I don't need a horse. I don't need a sword. <laughs> This, this needs to be a different kind of image. And um, Kahinda was incredibly successful at achieving that. Yeah, and then Amy Sherald's case, she had never done a commission portrait of a famous person. So and she was under a lot of, she felt a lot of pressure because she usually finds her models on the street. The portrait that really brought her to our attention was the one that won the Outwin Buchiever portrait competition in 2016, which was titled Miss Everything Unsuppressed Deliverance. Um, and the model for this was a friend of hers, Crystal Mack, who lived in Baltimore. And, um, and so this was a new kind of situation for Amy to be working with an iconic figure in American history and culture and having to create an inventive portrait of this um, very uh, well-known person. So it was a challenge and it was uh, honestly very stressful at times because it was working outside of um, her typical um, process and method. Right, in many ways, the painting of President Obama is a, a lot like the painting behind me, which is from a lot of people maybe atypical because they're used to these heroic, these grand heroic equestrian paintings, for example. And this is a very tender painting uh, that, that shows the humanity of its subject. And that's what happens when you are in front of this painting of President Obama. It's, uh, it's as if you're meeting this person um, mm -hmm. who is in a, in a way abstracted because he's kind of floating in space and becomes this, this image that is greater than just the human, human presence, but um, something that I think takes on the symbolic, but uh, but is is it has that human connection that um, I think we're uh, not used to seeing in in these more historical paintings of Gehende. Absolutely, now you use the the word icon, Dorothy, and I think that's an interesting word because uh, we've talked about that since before we opening the exhibition here. These paintings, these images have become iconic truly uh, in the sense that they're two of the most famous images probably of contemporary art today around the world. I think that's uh, something that we all could argue. Um, and so in that sense, they're, they're iconic images. And to go uh, from being paintings unveiled at the NPG to uh, this tour uh, and being so well known by everyone uh, is quite remarkable. Again, something that I've never experienced before. But um, when we think of icons, of course, we think of uh, objects of religious devotion, and these are human beings, uh, real life human beings who we are familiar with from our history. Um, but if uh, we can think about them as icons outside of just being famous, um, what kinds of things do you think we can, um, do, do they symbolize uh, for us? Um, for example, um, maybe the, the idea of hope or aspiration. Yeah, I, when we first saw the painting, oh, sorry, you froze for a second, Michael. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I guess I was just saying uh, about their iconicity in terms of contemporaneity and um, so. Yeah, and I, I was about to say when we first saw these portraits down in the basement of the National Portrait Gallery when they were uncrated. And, um, you know, we had never, no one had seen them yet. It was breathtaking because we saw the way they were breaking from tradition and the, um, you know, in, in the background of the uh, Kehinde Wiley painting with the flora and the leaves and his approachable um, pose. And then, and he's very earthly, grounded. And then she's ethereal with the celestial background and you have to look up at her with this triangular composition. And we immediately thought of a contemporary Madonna. And, um, and we were just stunned by the way that um, they, these artists had both, and they were not looking at each other's work along the way, yet they were working sort of in the same mode. And these portraits, as you see, speak to each other. So there was something magical there in the way they come together. Did they even know that each other, that, that the other was working on the paintings? 
they did because the there was a leak in the um, press of who the artists were. So they did know, but they were not, um, you know, sharing each other's images. And so it was, you know, a surprise to them as well as to us and to the Obamas um, to see them together and the way the compositions, they actually face each other. They really complement each other in wonderful ways. Um, I just love the, the kind of a horror vacui of, of President Obama's portrait, right? How full it is with that, with that flora and the sparseness, the quietness of uh, Michelle Obama's um, and, and, and the botanical patterns and also the geometric ones. There's a beautiful conversation going on between them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, even in the installation where at the High Museum where you're experiencing each of them separately, um, that power is kind of collective when you go from Michelle Obama's to the president's portrait. Um, and we've had, thinking again, just about icons, we have had uh, people who have these paintings and brought them to tears. Is that something that, I mean, this, you think of like pilgrimages to see, you know, like iconic images in around the world where that happens. Uh, and that says to me that there's something that these paintings mean that is beyond art, beyond painting, a painted portrait, but perhaps connected to the idea that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, aspiration, uh, that the American presidency is always for young people in this country, been the sort of apex of aspiration um, that, you know, if you study hard enough someday, you, you too can be the president, right? So in a way that's, that's so pal palpable in these paintings and I think it helps to, it moves people. Definitely. And I think the, the fact that they are so different from tradition precisely provides that point of access, you know, that possibility for imagining yourself um, you know, for, for thinking, oh, this is, uh, th these paintings embody a different kind of power. And it's the power that we all have as citizens too, and as people who can have an impact in our own society. I, I do think that the, um, both Obamas tapped into these artists' interests in future generations. And I'll never forget Amy Sherald, um, when she won the Outwin Buchiever portrait competition in 2016, uh, she was talking about her winning portrait with a group of, of young students. And they came up to her afterwards. It was a group of African-American students who were around fourth grade and said, um, why, and one young girl said, why did you paint this portrait? And Amy leaned down and said, I painted it for you so that when you come to a museum, you'll see someone who looks like you on the wall. And that message I am sure is one that Michelle Obama wanted to carry forward and saw that Amy could deliver that. So it's, you know, th these are really for the future um, and, and the way that young people react to them says it all. Absolutely. I uh, have to apologize. I'm having a little connectivity issue here. So uh, I'm gonna, uh, try to move things along so we can talk about the future of the National Portrait Gallery and what you, the work that you're doing there, which I believe leads us to the next slide. Um, if we can move to the next slide. Uh, I um, failed to mention in my introduction that uh, you'll be doing a reinstallation of the collection that's forthcoming reinstallation. So I was wondering if uh, perhaps Taina could tell us about how conversations about representation will be reflected in your forthcoming reinstallation? Well, conversations about representation um, are have been happening for, um, I would say, a good decade um, at the National Portrait Gallery. I think um, we, we have a fantastic director, Kim Sayed, who um, took on her uh, the directorship of the Portrait Gallery nine years ago and who um, very quickly realized that the portrait gallery could be um, a, a place that it was not yet, I think. Uh, a place that could represent the nation in all its diversity, 
in um, its great cultural richness. And so something that we have been uh, talking very much about uh, that has been guiding our thought, our archivatorial thought, is the question of who is absent from our galleries? Who is absent from our permanent collection? And why? As we know, portraiture is an art form that, um, that has been there to cement the power of the elite. And so that means that many people who did not have that kind of power uh, were not represented in portraiture. Uh, we really have to wait to wait until the 20th century um, and to look very deeply into certain, you know, traditions of documentation to find portraits of people who have contributed to the nation, but who have traditionally been uh, not part of the of the historical narrative uh, of the what what do we call the master historical narrative, right? Yeah. And so uh, this is, for example, a photograph of Jaime Escalante. Um, I don't know if you've seen the wonderful film Stand and Deliver and Stand and Deliver with uh, Edward James Olmos about uh, this transformative uh, math teacher from originally from Bolivia who taught in the high school system of Los Angeles and who insisted in teaching calculus to his students who were from a Mexican, mainly Mexican American high school and uh, the school system had given up on them. And uh, he persevered, he went against the grain really against what the authorities wanted for those children. And he demonstrated that the, those kids were capable um, of loving math and of uh, excelling at it. Um, and that uh, created this incredible moment of change where AP exams became really um, uh, administered also in, in high schools that usually had no access to them. And so these are the kinds of figures that we are uh, bringing into our collection, uh, figures that have been uh, marginal, as I said, in the, in the traditional accounts of history, but who have been fundamental in changing our society. I think we have another slide, uh, which is fabulous, of Celia Cruz. <laughs> That's wonderful. It's fabulous. Yes, this is a wonderful photograph by uh, Alexis Rodriguez Duarte and Tico Torres, who are uh, a fantastic pair of artists who always work together, Alexis is a photographer and Tico Torres is a stylist. They are Cuban American and they were, they photographed extensively Celia Cruz in uh, her last decade. And uh, they have a wonderful series called Cuba Out of Cuba that documents the Cuban, Cuban exiles, not just in the United States, but around the world. Um, and as we know, Celia Cruz is another just giant figure in the, in the field of music, someone who absolutely deserved to be at the portrait gallery. And um, I was very proud to bring this work into our collection. And uh, the next slide is another recent acquisition by Ruben Salazar. Yes, a wonderful portrait of Ruben Salazar by artist Ruben, Rupert Garcia. And Ruben Salazar was one of the first, or the first a uh, Mexican-American writer to be employed by a major newspaper, the LA Times, and who covered the issues that Mexican-Americans were facing in the 60s and 70s. Um, and well, not exactly the 70s because he uh, died in 1970 during a protest against the Vietnam War, um, tragically really, but uh, this is a fantastic portrait that really, as you can see, draws on the tradition of pop art to represent um, Ruben Salazar. And there's another rather contemporary image here um, that I find really interesting as well. Um, I, by an artist. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, these two portraits are fantastic. They're by uh, Freddy Rodriguez, a Dominican artist uh, who lives in New York. And they are of Dominican uh, Major League Baseball players, Big Papi. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, Alex Rodriguez, and again, another uh, couple of portraits that are very much inspired by pop art, 
by the tradition of silhouette portraiture as well. And, and you can see in these series of images that you've shown, um, Michael, how, uh, how flexible the notion of portraiture is at the National Portrait Gallery. Um, and the Obama portraits tie into that beautifully um, by bringing in just uh, per perhaps in the most unexpected realm, which is that of state portraiture, which one would expect to be always realist, right. always like, uh, serious, um, right. a different kind of representation. Right. And that's so interesting how you're changing the, you both have changed the genre in the past decade and through your work at the gallery. Um, and Um, identity, identify rather, sorry, um, which it's not a picture, right? We're not looking at pictures, but we're rather experiencing something that's time-based that happens in real time that may not even be documented. Right. We're, we embrace con, um, conceptual portraiture, new forms of portraiture. And in 2015, I introduced performance art really as a way to be nimble within a system that is um, takes a long time. We're a federal bureaucracy at the Smithsonian and to um, really make a change can take a long time, but performance can happen in real time. Um, people can come together in person and have an experience that is ephemeral, but profound. And I um, and my colleagues invite artists to propose new performances that insert voices and identities that are missing from the collection. And um, in this case, this is a performance by Jeffrey Gibson, whose mother was Choctaw from Mississippi. He invited a group of um, LBGTQI plus volunteers to come into the museum and participate in a drum circle, wearing these garments that he had created with names on them. Um, and uh, each chose their own name. The performance, which traveled to the new museum in New York after the National Portrait Gallery is called To Name Another. And as the uh, viewers watched and listened to the sound of the drums, actually everyone's heartbeat comes into sync in a drum circle. So it created this profound sense of, of community. Wow, within a the visceral museum. sense of community in a way, right? Yes, really, really beautiful performance. And who is this? Uh, this is image? another image from that same performance. And this is actually an image of the artist, Nakisha Durrett, who's a Washington-based artist. A lot of times with our performance art series, a local artists participate. So oh. it's, it's not only about the artist who is, um, who is overseeing the performance, but a, a way for other artists to insert their voice in the space alongside the community. I think we have another image from a separate performance, right? Yes, this is a performance called Pieta by uh, Wanda Raimondi Ortiz, who is based in Florida. Uh, she uh, proposed this performance as she reflected on her fears about being the mother of a brown skinned son um, she invited the um, Howard University Gospel Choir to participate in the performance. And one by one, she held members of the audience in her arms. And as the choir sang and filled the space with sound, um, the visitor being held would sort of sink into her body. And uh, it was this cathartic experience, um, really not only for the visitors, but who are being held, but for everybody, all of the viewers. This is the last performance that happened in the space where Michelle Obama's portrait was installed. And so when I saw the triangular composition that reminded me of a contemporary Madonna, I immediately connected the portrait by Amy Sherrill to this performance, which was really kind of a beautiful moment. Um, so, uh, the, these series are, are very, this performance art series has been a way for us to expand definitions of portraiture. And our next um, performance piece will be by Marin Hassinger. Oh, wow. Um, it's called Birthright. And that will, will be curated by our time-based media curator, Charlotte Dickies. Fantastic. 
How long was this performance? What was the duration? It was about an hour. And we actually had worried that it would be um, hard to get people from the audience to feel vulnerable enough to go up and be held. But there was a line of people waiting by the end of the performance because uh, they wanted so much to be part of it. I think it looks like an amazing performance. Um, and, I, and I respond to that feeling, that desire to uh, express one's emotions or express one's vulnerability. Um, and in a way, it's kind of like a, an, an emotional aesthetic kind of experience that is quite beautiful. And I think that's what you've been able to do with the both of you, two of you with this exhibition is to uh, create an exhibition that provides that kind of emotional aesthetic experience with these two portraits. Certainly the, from our visitors who've come to the museum, uh, those two are, everyone's joyful. Everyone's celebratory. People are in tears uh, with uh, tears of thanks, uh, pride. Uh, the paintings and the exhibition uh, are um, validating, as you both were alluding to earlier. But also, um, uh, I think reminders that art does something more than simply hang on a wall and represent something that's rare or valuable. That it has a meaning to our lives and. Uh, I can't thank you enough, both of you, for this exhibition uh, and for bringing it to Atlanta. Thank I think you. we have, yeah, oh you. yeah. We have some questions, uh, a little time for some Q&A and uh, my colleague Yadira uh, is going to be sending me, a sh I think she is sending me some in our chat room. So um, now if, uh, I see a lot of questions and uh, if Adira can perhaps send me the first one, we can uh, put that forward to you both. Um, and we'll wait for a moment. Oh, wait, sorry, there's a cute, I'm sorry, you guys. I'm not, I'm not good at this uh, Zoom thing. So I, I try my best. There's a Q and A room. So, um, let me see here. Here's a painting. Uh, yes, the recording will be, uh, tonight's program is recorded. Oh, sorry. Here's a, a question uh, from uh, an audience member. Since the arrangements for uh, who ready with the uh, Trump administration, who is doing the former president's portraits? and his wife's portrait. You cut out a little, did, was that a question about the next administration, the Trump portraits? Um, we don't reveal the names of the artists until the unveiling. So they are in process, but the artists' names are, are not public yet. Uh, here's a question I'm going to just uh, kind of pick from uh, our chat room. Do the vice presidents get portraits? Uh, and if so, are they ever shown? For example, we have an historical vice president right now, right? the first black woman president, vice president. Right. Traditionally, they, the vice presidents do not get their portrait made, but historic figure, people who make history by being the first often get their portraits uh, collected by the portrait gallery. Um, and we collect by different processes. Sometimes we commission portraits, sometimes we just collect existing portraits. So um, the process may vary, uh, but I, I am sure that uh, Kamala Harris will be represented in our, in our collection. Another question, how will the Obama portraits in the White House differ from these that we have on view here at the museum? Interestingly, they have not yet been unveiled. Um, they will be at some point, um, and there are differences. Uh, but since the names haven't been released yet of those artists, <laughs> I'm again not at liberty to do that tonight. But um, the artists, it is an interesting process because it's a different set of artists, and um, and they are very different from the ones at the National Portrait Gallery. Um, and it's you know interesting to think about how different artists approach the same subject and what brought them to the um, finished portrait. So those are yet to be unveiled. 
a related question is that, is there a way, once the paintings are unveiled, revealed, is there a way to see the White House portraits somehow online since it's a private collection or do you have to be a visitor to the White House? The White House Historical Association, if you go to the website, is has the White House portraits on the website. I believe that they have all of them. Is that correct, Taina? That is correct, yes. And they also, uh, the White House, of course, ho uh, hosts uh, private tours, I mean, you, um, of certain areas of the White House. So it is possible to view some of the portraits that way. Uh, one other, uh, one interesting question just came through the feed. What, uh, and that is what conservation care to the portraits is required when the return to the portrait gallery after this long tour um, being on the road? That is an excellent question. And we work very closely with our head of conservation, Lou Molnar, who um, at each step of the way, as the portraits travel from one venue to the next, is um, in conversation with the registrars of each museum, just making sure that the portraits have uh, traveled safely, that they, are, they, are, they have arrived in good condition. Um, and once they come back, um, she will she will spend time with them, make sure they they are in excellent condition, and they will back go back um, on our walls. Um, I think as a protective measure, something that we can say is that we they they are also covered. They're glazed. They're covered by uh, by glass, and so uh, that also protects them while they're traveling. Right. Uh, one more question, uh, actually two, because I've seen this pop up all during our conversation. So someone's uh, very interested to know the name of the film you mentioned, Taina, in reference to the first fo the photograph you showed. Uh, and I've, I'm forgetting it in my... It's Stand on the Liver. Stand, Stand on the Liver. Yes, it's a fantastic movie from, uh, I think, 1990. Uh, very powerful. With Edward James almost playing Jaime Escalante. And a final question uh, is uh, from a viewer is uh, on average, what's the time frame of an unveiling or is there a process related to the unveiling of the portraits? Does that, or is that, is that typically something really public or is it always something very private? It is it's a private. Yeah, go, oh, go ahead. ahead. No, sorry, I didn't want it's to. A pri it's a private unveiling event. However, for the first time, this was uh, broadcast with the Obama portrait. It's live on CNN. So um, it became a more public event um, than it had been in the past. And I imagine that would continue, um, but it's it's also speaks to the power and interest in portraiture now <laughs> that it would be broadcast live. And, you know, immediately there was all sorts of Twitter and, um, other newscasts and then articles came out. So it was sort of a snowball effect um, from that unveiled unveiling um, that, you know, portraiture was was back out in the in the news media. So um, it's it feels like the right thing for it is to be a public event, you know. Now, I remember that unveiling. I remember getting a text image from the gallerist for Kahinde. Uh, they sent me an image similar to the one that we've seen, we saw at the beginning of the program, and it just was palpable, the excitement. Of course, uh, so appropriate uh, given the Obamas were the first uh, presidents, uh, uh, Mr. Obama was the first president during the social media age that we would start getting these texts and images during the unveiling, but uh, really an exciting moment. Um, again, it's been a real honor for you both to join us this evening. I'm so grateful for your time and for your expertise and your knowledge. And for this exhibition, thank you. Um, for everyone uh, watching, you should go to high.org and get your tickets um, for the exhibition. And better yet, join the museum and get your tickets so you can become a member of our family and see amazing uh, exhibitions like this exhibition, the Obama Portraits Tour, once in a lifetime. You gotta come see it while it's on to you. So with that, uh, I wanna thank you all again for joining us. Dorothy Moss, Taina Caragol, thank you so much. I look forward to staying in touch.
have a good night, everybody. Thank you, Michael. This has been a, a really, uh, a real pleasure to collaborate with the High. We thank your whole team. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.